Hello and welcome back to the Play It Forward podcast presented by Peace Players, the podcast where we lift up voices and stories of people working in their communities and networks to promote peace and equity. My name is Chenny Nawagbo, and you all know already that I am excited and thrilled about this show. I know we're going to get a ton of brilliant nuggets um, for you all, but really for me. Uh, <laughs> so I am always happy to just... Um, be exposed to wisdom and authentic leadership. And I think mm -hmm. that's what we're going to have today. And that being said, on today's episode, we'll be speaking to our very special guests about the road to authentic leadership, how opportunity meets preparation. Um, and before we get there, though, I, I've got to slow down just a tad bit and introduce probably the most amazing man in the world. Um, you all know him as my brilliant and amazing co-host, Emmett Shepard. Guys, guys, calm down, calm down. I'm just <laughs> a human being at the end of the day. I put my pants on one leg at a time. Ginny, you know, uh, uh, how are you? I haven't seen you in a minute. I know, oh I God. know. I am I am well. Um, I'm completely fangirling over here. Uh, cause I, know. You know, I mean, I know, same. I'm yeah, kind of like, um, I don't know whether to address it right away. Cause like I'm sweating profusely out of nerves and excitement at the same time. Right. But, right. Oh my God. What a way to end season three, like yeah. the perfect guest to end yeah. season three in the best yeah. way possible. Yeah. Um, hello everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Emmett Shepard. I'm the lanky and somewhat funny co-host to the beautifully intelligent an incredibly compassionate Jenny Nuagbo. Mm -hmm. And Jenny, I'm excited. Mm -hmm. I, I, I got nothing else to say. I, I'm yeah. excited. And oh, quickly, before we dive right in, okay. people, if you want to hear more of me and Chinny, see highlights, see behind the scenes, see the banter that happens off camera, follow us at Peace Players at Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. Jenny, take it away. Thank you for the handoff. Um, and as I mentioned, I am fangirling um, because the resume um, and the accolades of this human being is absolutely phenomenal. So I'll start there. Our guest's resume is very impressive and I wish I can go and cover it all. I cannot, not today, not tomorrow. It keeps going and going. But here are some uh, highlighted bullets. She is the daughter, and this is the part that I love the most, uh, the daughter of uh, Jamaican immigrants. Um, this New York native is the first in her family to go to college. After graduating from a historically black women's college, Spelman College, with a degree in economics, she went into publishing and wealth management before she transitioned into philanthropy. In 2013, she was named the executive director, and then in 2019, promoted to the CEO of the Dodgers Foundation. We can spend the whole entire episode discussing all the achievements that the Dodgers Foundation has received under her tutelage, under her leadership. But instead, I'll just let you guys know that the, the organization has won an SB award. It was awarded the Beyond Sport Award. Award for reducing racial inequalities. Their fundraising has increased a thousand percent and she has fostered relationships and partnerships that have led to more than, and I'm reading this because I need to read this because there's no way that I could remember all of this, 40 million in community investments impacting 2.3 million children. Now, if you're not already up out of your seats clapping, um, and if you don't have a pen and taking notes, I don't know what to tell you, but please help me welcome Nicole Upman, you're amazing, and thank you for being on the show. I admit that's exactly what we need to do. Yeah, Welcome. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. How Sorry. are you? How are you? I am wonderful. Thank you, Chene. Thank you, Emmett. It is so just a pleasure, frankly, to be with you both. Thank you for that amazing introduction. No, thank no, you Nicole. for the work. I mean, you know. Yeah, seriously. The, don't yeah. thank us. The only thing you should thank me for is you're the only guest I've actually stood up for. for so, exactly. so most of the time, I'm yeah. just in oh, this chair. I'm glued you, here. Thank you. Um, that's, Nicole, that's a big deal. I don't know, you know, if you've heard the whispers in the streets <laughs> of LA, um, you know, it's for sure. Uh, Chinny's heard it in the yeah. suburbs and in the, city heard it of Maryland. The world. Yeah. Life's heard it in New York. There's, there's <laughs> these, there are these songs that the children sing yeah, um, about the icebreaker king. <laughs> now, I don't know if you know about the Icebreaker King, but uh, yes, no. this yes, was a no. title that was not given to me. This right. was something that, you know, just right. throughout time has sort of <laughs> transcended <laughs> all of humanity. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. And so how we want to start this episode is usually just by an icebreaker, just to uh, how we say break the ice. Yes, exactly. And today's icebreaker is what's the best 
piece of advice that you've ever been given? Wow. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to roll with a quote by Jackie Robinson. Oh, which yes. Is not important except in the impact that it has on other lives. It's my mm -hmm. mantra. It's the quote I live by. It guides my every personal, professional move that I make um, as a mother, as a wife, as a professional, as a friend, as a mentor, all of mm -hmm. the above. But um, obviously Jackie wasn't alive to give it to me personally, but I have right. to tell you that, that is the advice of my lifetime. Right, mm. right. Uh, That's amazing. Can, can you say it one more time just so that yes. I can settle in it? Mm -hmm. A life is not important except in the impact that it has on other lives. Wow. Mm. Mm. Ooh. Um, Do you remember the first time you heard it or no? Yes, um, I actually was awarded a scholarship by the Jackie Robinson yes. Foundation. We're gonna get into <laughs> um, right before attending Spelman College, right. um, and it was a part of our let's call it curriculum, a part mm. of our professional development, and it stuck with me since then and has guided mm. me in such a significant way. Right, mm. right. Mm. Can I ask you a question? This is a this is not actually on scripted, but yeah. How do we find the balance of that, that quote, right? Your life, you are here to serve something greater than yourself, right? Your life is indicative of that. If people are, 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 are getting something from the work that you're doing, like you're putting that out there. There was something that Maya Angelou, I think it was a quote by her that said, I come as one, but I, I stand as 10,000. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that my, in my mind, it's connected to to your quote, um, to that advice. Uh, and that is your life is here to serve. How do you find the balance of serving, but also making sure that you're taking care of yourself, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And I, I have yeah. to say, uh, Chinny, I learned that pretty late in life. And that's one of my big nuggets for younger folks, right? Is that you have to find that balance between serving others and serving yourself. Uh, when I say you're no good to anybody else unless you're good to yourself, you're no Absolutely. good to anybody else unless mentally and physically you're okay. Mm. And so I think there there is a balance mm. um, I think that you can find that balance. I think right. you actually can take better care of yourself sometimes, depending on who you are, especially for me, if right. you know you've taken care of others. Right. Um, and you know you right. are taking care of others, right? right. If that's what drives you and that's what motivates you and that's what makes you happy mm. and energizes you, you can right. use also fuel that same balance of taking care of yourself, that right. same energy to take care of yourself, right? right? And if you're so moved by this idea of serving others and paying it forward, you're going to make sure you take care of yourself so you can continue to do that. Because right. you realize at a certain point that yes, that can be quite exhausting if you mm. really break that that quote down and you really break the Maya piece that you mentioned down. But if you give yourself a chance every now and then to sort of really pause and really re-energize and really right. step back, right. but you can keep doing it, it does end up balancing itself out and somewhat working out. Absolutely. Yeah. I I, I just say that and I appreciate that response because. Sometimes um, when you're in the space and you're, you're giving everything you give um, and you can, what ends up happening sometimes is that, you know, as women, there's a, a sense of shame when you want to like kind of just retract and recoil yeah. and give to yourself. And so that mindset of understanding that that is okay, your cup has to be full in order to give to others. Yes. Um, it, it you have, have great people around you, Chini. Yeah, you have yeah. great people around you that tell you that that's okay, right? Mm. So that be a spouse, significant other, friends, mm. family, mm. children. Um, at a certain point, like you hope that you're surrounded by people that essentially tell you that you have to give to yourself and make mm. you make it okay and give mm. you the opportunity to do so as opposed to the guilt to feel like it's not. Because you're absolutely right. I think we go through life um, with so many different hats. And especially in this nonprofit philanthropic space, you say to yourself all the time, <laughs> there's no way I can turn off. That's not right. right. You know, yeah. need 365 days a year. Right. Um, but if you surround yourself, I think with the right folks who, who say to you, no, you actually have to stop. You have to pause. Right. That's right. helpful. Yeah. And like training and training yourself to like, 
view the word as selfish as not a negative connotation yeah. as like right. a necessity kind of thing right. you know right. it, it's so crucial yeah 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 all right nicole you you've certainly had a wonderful career uh you graduate from spelman with a degree in economics and then you start your professional journey in wealth management and then fast forward to now uh, you're a ceo of the dodgers uh and i think what's uh, what i'd like to, to learn and hopefully our guests would like to learn is to fill in that gap. Tell us how you transitioned from financial investments to this philanthropic career. Um, really, you know, and, and this relentless passion to improving the lives of just people, young people uh, in LA, but really around the world, right? Because if you improve one life, you impact the entire world. So yeah, tell us about yeah. that. I have a very interesting journey. So as you um, you mentioned, I went to Spelman College and I was an economics major with a minor in management and organization. I grew up in New York City and mm, I watched business nice. happen everywhere. And I essentially told myself at a pretty young age that I wanted to be, a, I wanted to be in finance, I wanted to work in investments and I wanted to work on Wall Street some way, somehow. And so I ended up going to school and every single summer doing an investment management or an investment banking internship throughout college saying that's what I was going to do. Mm. I had um, amazing offers upon graduation. It was offered the opportunity to work for a, a phenomenal financial institution. And I will say that within about a year and a half of being there, I quickly realized that that's not what I wanted to do. Mm. I often say at that age, we're sort of like fresh out of college, we're somewhat young and dumb, and you know, we want to do a whole lot <laughs> of things, but I took a big risk and did a significant networking throughout New York City, and I went on some informational interviews, and in one of those interviews, I met the director of marketing for Essence Magazine, Ooh, and nice. you know, at the end of the informational interview, she hired me, and that's how I got into the publishing space, just on skill set, on ambition, on my passion on passion, on just my delivery, right? Yeah. In this informational interview. And I ended up spending about six years in the publishing industry, working for Essence Magazine and Black Enterprise Magazine, doing sponsorship marketing and advertising, coming from investment banking, which was pretty crazy. Mm -hmm. And um, I loved what I was doing. I, I was inching my way closer towards this creativity that I knew that was inside of me, this sort right. of innovation. And I ended up having an opportunity to move to Los Angeles while working with Black Enterprise Magazine and came okay. out here. And while I was here, I went to a conference in Phoenix, Arizona, and I met the current president and CEO of the Jackie Robinson Foundation. Wow. And she said to me, we're opening up an LA office to be a satellite to our New York space, and we would love for you to be a part of leadership. And I was like, no way. I've never thought about working for a nonprofit. I'd heard all of the myths. I was like, uh, I'm not going to make any money. What is this? <laughs> time how is this going to work out um, <laughs> I myself am a beneficiary of several nonprofits. it's how mm. I went to high school it's how right. I've taken care of after school it's how I, I went that. to college on scholarships from the United Negro College Fund from the Jackie Robinson, Jackie Robinson yeah and more and so being a product and a beneficiary of so many nonprofit organizations I pretty much served as a volunteer right I wanted mm. to give back as an alumni to so many different organizations I had acquired a great peer group of friends from so many of these amazing organizations, but I had never once thought about actually working in the space or working for one of the organizations. Right. I ended up having like maybe a six month conversation um, with the president and CEO, and I ended up going to work for the Jackie Robinson Foundation. Um, wow. And I often tell people, I feel like I got a doctoral degree in nonprofit management over my <laughs> years there, <laughs> just doing the work, right? right. Like really doing the work and having this opportunity to um, meet so many corporate partners, but also so many sports partners um, like the major league baseball teams from right. the St. Louis West. I covered the West territory. So a really great opportunity to meet a great, a lot of people, a really great opportunity to recruit scholars um, to the program, you know, who could be scholarship recipients. And I mm -hmm. did all of this telling my story as a former Jackie Robinson, Robinson scholar. Yeah. That and so as an alumna of the program, I never knew that I could use my story, my own very story, like my power, that that was my power, truly. Right, right. Um, and that's why I found passion in philanthropy. That's why mm. I found, oh, wow, this is what I want to do. 
I want to use myself as a living example, frankly, and a leader for right. children, for families, for, you know, adults who are looking, looking to do something more for communities that want to thrive. Right. Um, that's how it kind of began. You know, from there, I ended up working for a public school reform organization in Los Angeles because I wanted to get to understand the Los Angeles Unified School District for myself, for my right. children, um, you know, just because I had been here for a number of years. And I really um, dived into public school reform and then took a little detour to college access and success. Again, it's all staying within the education space of it. Mm. And then when I was working for College Summit as their executive director of their Northern California and their Southern California offices, I went to Dodger Stadium one day, not even knowing that they were looking for an executive director for the Dodgers Foundation under the new ownership group. And I walked out of the stadium uh, with an interview, uh, two weeks following of interviews with the ownership group. And next thing you know, what I was the executive director of the Dodgers Foundation. Sounds like you need to be a part of my friend group. And <laughs> no, that's awesome. And whatever yeah. your elevator pitch was to get you the, yeah. Um, yeah. And of course, the work <laughs> behind you, that's phenomenal. phenomenal. The subtle flex, the real subtle flex. Pot, a real the... melting pot of wow. all my prior experiences that I, wow. I didn't know existed but it's all happened for a reason it's amazing how life does that to you sorry go ahead emmett go please no, i just love the subtle flex of getting hired in an informational interview like that yeah. and she just no, like no. touched upon that and then no. kept going and i was like oh wow that's you know, people don't know. Like it's about being yeah. in the right rooms in the right space right time i'm right never doubting yourself and what right. could possibly come out of something and being right. willing to take that risk right i didn't well, know all that at the time but i uh -huh. people get that from it yeah absolutely yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. No, it works that way. Informational interviews are key, you all. For Nicole, real. Nicole, you said you mentioned that you felt like there was a, is a pivotal moment where you sort of realized the power of your own story as sort of the propelling force to want mm -hmm. to do philanthropy in the first place is that that's a really, I think, um, what takes a, a great deal of uh, resilience and also self-awareness and uh and a sense of of knowing your place and knowing also the where you could go with this story did it feel at any point um like you said you wanted to be a leader for future people to be like mm. look what can do what can happen if you go through this path sort of to speak um how do i phrase this is, is it more so did you did you feel more pressure in that moment, once that realization sort of clicked to be like, now, now it's not just about me going back to that Maya Angelou quote. Now, now there's, it seems as though there's a lot of other people at stake, or were you able to sort of just separate those two things and still be like, no, I'm still focusing on me and thinking about me in this Great case. question. Great um, question. Great question. Yeah, you know what? Um, all the pressure. I still feel the pressure today. Mm. Um, there's a couple of reasons there. One, I think when you decide to truly tell your authentic story, you're, you you're being vulnerable. Mm. Yeah. You're unveiling things that you might not have shared with other people. Right. You're unveiling things that maybe as a first generation American, your family yeah. isn't quite sure they wanted you to unveil to other people. Right. Right. Um, you're speaking up, frankly, in rooms, in conversations, et cetera, that you normally wouldn't have in spaces sometimes where you're not expected to, or you're not wanted to, right? right? And we're um, not valued as well. Yeah. Sometimes you are fighting that, I don't want to speak for everybody, even though you feel like you have shared experiences with, with a certain group and you should be speaking for right. other people mm. in order to lift certain groups up, right? right. Um, it's a lot of pressure. It's a lot of pressure, frankly, to be your authentic self. And I also feel like once you claim your story, you can't go back. Mm -hmm, you right. have to either like sit in that space and continue to, or you can literally ramp it up, frankly, and use it in so many other spaces and in so many other ways. Um, but it's freeing. It's pressure and it's freeing at the same time. Right, right. right. Because you do feel... A, a lot of accountability, frankly. Yes. Tell. Yes. Um, and you kind of know that it's like you say it out loud, and you sort of are like, "Yeah, that's me. I know. I know me." Kind of thing. Right. And there's this re reaffirming moment where you get to go, "Yeah, no. Yeah, this is yeah. me." Kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I, I want to say this, Emmett. You brought up two words, two very strong characteristics, right? Resilience. 
uh, and then having the awareness, right? Um, and then we talk about the, I come as one, but stand as 10,000. Uh, and so what I hear is excellence. And I'm writing this, like I would say, capstone memoir, if you will, uh, of a guide for uh, Black women's authentic, like their, their, their guide to 10 principles to authentic uh, leadership. And oh, in that, we wait. talk about... The, we actually wrote your email because I want you to be a part of it, but uh, we'll talk about that later. Um, we talk about, uh, I talk about how it is ingrained in me. So I'm first born generation, Nigerian parents, um, this idea of excellence. My dad would always teach me this idea of excellence and how you need to be excellent in every single space and every situ single situation in your mindset, spiritually, you need to be excellent. And in order for me to be excellent, um, you need to, and, and excellence is derived from resilience, right? So and what I'm learning as a Black woman now is that in order for me to even be considered average in these spaces where I'm not supposed to be included according to the systemic uh, institutions that don't include me, um, excellence is what is the driving force behind my success. Um, awareness of who I am in the context of this world is also uh, a tool. Uh, resilient, like, so all of these things, all of these yeah. components, um, and while you say you feel the pressure, it is uh, pressure uh, that has been ingrained from you since birth, um, from parents, from the way Absolutely. they work. Um, yeah. And it's not a bad pressure, it's just a pressure. It's, it's, yeah. a, it's almost like a, a motivation, a motivational pressure to yeah. get out and give I you absolutely balance. believe that that excellence that you're talking about was ingrained in me from a very mm. young age, right? It's my parents' history. It's right. like, you now the reason we came to this country was so you and your brothers and sisters ex, can have a better life. You, just, you carry that, right? You carry mm. that. You mm. end up in a space where it's extremely beneficial, right? Because excellence becomes your driver and you're motivated and believe you can do anything and that you must do anything, right? For yourself, yeah. your family, for those who are like you, et cetera. And then I think at a certain point, though, you balance that too. You realize, yeah. like, okay, I've arrived. So they've arrived. Right. And so let's either like pivot a little bit or let's figure out how um, I create my own sort identity. of identity. Identity. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. exactly. Yes. exactly. Yes. But I believe it's the thing that. It got me to the I arrived point. Right, right. Yeah. right. And right, right, once right. you've planted the seeds that of the I of I've arrived, that's when you really start that path of authentic uh, leadership. Um, yeah, because you're okay. Oof. You're okay. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, Woo! <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. So yeah, I, I just want to um, get one more question in before we get to this be beautiful and amazing um, lightning round um, that Emmett has put together for us because he's just phenomenal. Um, but I read something about you um, in Sports Illustrated uh, and it's uh, it was entitled uh, Serving the Entire LA Community in a Lofty Mission by, um, um, uh, but Nicole Whitman is up for the challenge. Uh, and I fell in love with this quote that you said, you said, I am, I hate the word just, but I'll, I'll, re I'll read what you said. I'm just a product of organizations who said, if you give access and opportunity, there will be results. Yeah. Uh, and this is very, in my mind, a very, if I ask this question, I mean, I know the answer to it because, you know, I'm a black woman in the United States, but I would love for you to answer this for our guests. And, and that is, um, why is providing equal opportunities uh, for young people, people of color and women, so important. But not just that, could you say more about what you mean by there will be results? Because oftentimes <laughs> you give people access, opportunity, people of color, access, opportunity, um, resources, and they do well. And folks are like, wow. But yeah. anyway, tell me, yeah. talk to us a bit about what there will be results mean. What do you yeah. believe that means? Yeah, I wholeheartedly believe that if you provide access and opportunity to marginalized populations, communities, individuals, families, that it will essentially lead to increased self-confidence, yes, yes. And possibilities for the future mm. um, and more, but strengthened communities mm. lead to strengthened cities, lead to, lead to strengthen infrastructure, leads to a strengthened country and leads yep. to a strengthened world. Right. We can't leave people behind 
and envision that a small population gets to sort of push forward and be okay. Um, mm -hmm. Access and opportunity leads to all people having an opportunity to thrive. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that's part of why I do the work here at the Dodgers Foundation. We believe mm -hmm. that everyone, regardless of zip code, regardless of neighborhood, regardless of color, regardless of socioeconomic status, should have the opportunity to thrive. But everybody doesn't have the tools and the resources to do that. Right. And I know um, as an example that if you provide someone with the tools and the resources that this outcome is possible. Absolutely. So why not do that for others? And why right. not use the one-off mentality and apply it to massive groups of individuals, right. again, who are often living in the shadows, who are marginal, right who are called mm -hmm. minorities and every right. other word we can think of and essentially make sure that they can be a part of the majority. They can right. be a part of those who are moving forward, who are pressing right. forward. It right. is sometimes just that exposure and that awareness um, that can really change an outcome. Right, mm -hmm. right, 100%, yeah. Um, sometimes you just gotta pause for a minute <laughs> and, take, and take that all in. Um, but yeah, Chinny, why don't you introduce what 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 what's it called? The um, Thunder pew, pew, pew. round. Yeah, Welcome pew, pew, pew. to the <laughs> lightning round. Hosted by Emmett, our amazing, amazing host here. Um, well, you'll have a chance to exhale and listen and answer some questions. We won't put too much pressure on you, but yeah, you'll have we'll three judge to four you seconds. Heavily. We'll judge you heavily, Nicole. It doesn't matter. <laughs> we'll have three to four seconds to answer some fun, light questions that Emmett has put together. And I'm really excited about this. Emmett, all yours. You got and your pen and paper, Jenny. You ready? Yes, I have it. I have it. He's already said our favorite <laughs> phrase, which is we will judge. We'll judge you heavily. We'll heavily. judge you very heavily. Oh, with one of your oh, answers. Boy, here we all go. Right. Here we go. Okay. Here we go. Nicole, are you ready? Yes. All right. Here we go. <clears throat> <laughs> Stretch. Chess? Stretch. Chess or checkers? Checkers. Okay. Mm. Still water or seltzer water? Still water. Okay. Flying or driving? Flying. Me too. Dry, dry or humid? Dry. Ooh. Humid messes up the hair. <laughs> <laughs> the book, the book version or the movie version? Uh, the movie version. Oh, okay. okay. First one, and I like that. Okay, are you a little bit country or a little bit rock and roll? Rock and roll. Oh my god. <laughs> a little bit rock and roll. Okay. A little okay. bit rock and roll. Yeah. Okay. okay. Who wins in a game of baseball? A taco? We'll say hard shell taco. Or a grilled cheese. Wow. A grilled cheese. <laughs> <laughs> Say it with confidence. <laughs> a, gr a grill, yes. Say it with it is. <laughs> okay, summer or I'm winter hungry, Olympics. But a grilled cheese. Yeah. Why do you have do you have any reason for the grilled cheese winning? Yeah, like, uh, just... I am literally picturing a uh, half a sandwich and um a diamond. Mm, mm, so the whole mm, sandwich, I'm envisioning the diamond. Right. Okay. And the half a sandwich, I'm envisioning I'm envisioning a first, second, third base action. Like I was literally yeah, yeah. just Oh, a wisdom. Taco wisdom. Shape. That's what we're hearing right now. <laughs> so it had nothing wisdom. to do with the ingredients <laughs> or taste of either. It was a uh, visual for me. Yeah, yeah. Who 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 looks better on the map? Kind of. Thing. Right, right. Got you. Yeah, Got yeah, you. yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect, perfect. Okay, summer or winter Olympics. Summer. Ooh. Art museums or history museums. History. Oh, nice. Good. Yes. Okay. Where you come from. Your yes. most underrated childhood game that you would play. Um, Twister. Twister. <laughs> Shouts <laughs> out Twister. Uh -huh. Red foot blue. Twister. Shouts out. Yes, also tetherball. Sir. Tetherball. Okay. Sorry. Tetherball. Oh so much yes. fun. Yes. Oh, yeah. oh my god. We gotta bring Twister. Red light, back. green light. One, two, three. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> See the problem. Yeah. The problem with Twister is once you turn into an adult, like the flexibility goes out the window. Yeah. You like. Yeah, man, you, you know, like. You gonna break you know, yourself space. playing Twister? Yeah. You know, people, I mean, yeah. yeah. Um. Okay. Which do you prefer? A horse-sized duck or a hundred duck-sized horses? One horse-sized duck. Yeah. Yeah. You want that big, big duck? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Los Angeles Lakers or Los Angeles Clippers? 
Ooh. Oh, wow. Sorry. Sorry. This is. This wow. Is... Wow, Emmett. Do I have to answer? <laughs> yes. I do. mean, yeah, we do. <laughs> so in this space, it's so crazy in sports philanthropy and amongst the teams out here. In my mind, right, there's competition on the courts, on the field, right. everywhere, but there's no competition in the philanthropic work that yeah. we Everybody's not right. working. Let me take the philanthropic work out of it and say I love the Lakers and the Clippers for what we're all doing in the community. There, there you go. go. There you go. Yes. And I'm and I'm choosing the Lakers on an edge simply because they behold the Kobe legacy and I'm a massive mm. all right. Kobe Bryant. Well, mm. that they're well gonna we're, the this uh interview is over. Um you've done a great <laughs> job. Thank you so much for being here and stating the facts. Um, Just but yeah. straight back. They're straight back. So no. keep going, Emma. You got it. You got it. Sorry. Okay, we're almost done. Comedy or drama? Drama, for drama, sure. Yeah. Yeah. You learn something. You learn something. Really? Yeah. Comedian? You do. I I, I say dramedy. I say dramedy. Dramedy. Okay. 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 Uh, okay. Last thing you taught someone else to do. Ooh, I love this one. Oh my God, the last thing. So today is a Monday morning. So it would entail probably my child last night, um, teaching him how to return an online order um, mm. on his phone. <laughs> mm. Yes, mm. but I purchased yeah. that, you know, he needed to return all of the things. Yes, right. yes. Right. teaching my 13 right. year old how to do an online return. He's yeah, like, you can't, okay. you, you can't just buy all the things and they come and you're like, no, no, no. We have to return some of return these. Return yeah. all of that. Actually, we will We're walk all through that's it. That's dramedy right now. Right, right. <laughs> dramedy. <laughs> right. Right. That's funny. Yeah. And then finally, Nicole, one thing you want listeners to remember from today. That it's okay to talk about serious things and be lighthearted at the same time. Right. You guys are right. amazing hosts and you're setting like a total vibe for my Monday morning and frankly a tone for my week, which is pretty awesome. darn fantastic. Awesome. Yeah. And don't remember that Emmett's wearing an Oreos jersey. <laughs> <laughs> it's vintage. It's vintage. It's vintage. Brooks Robinson, the hot corner. You got to have him. You got to have him. Shout out my dad. He's, he's the O's okay. fan. He's the O's <laughs> fan. It could be worse. I could be a Sox fan. Like that would be, that would be bad. That would That'd be, be bad. bad. Yeah. 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 Um, well, congratulations. You've, you've you made finished. It. Yeah, you, oh, we'll, we'll tally up your score. We'll send yep. it to you separately. Yes, either. absolutely. I'm pretty sure you're the winner. That's fine. <laughs> um, but no, thank you for allowing us to have a little bit of fun. We try to like you know, as you said, incorporate it with some of the stuff that's uh, pressing and, and serious, but also, yeah. you know, life is life is not always serious. Um, so yeah, mm-hmm. uh, I do want to get to and, and and Emmett mentioned this before. This is more of the um, kind of a deeper conversation, but I think we've already done that in, in the beginning of the show. Uh, to some of the questions that that Emmett has, I have some questions here, but I, I want to hear Emmett's voice. Um, Emmett, you, you said you had some questions, and I, and I, I don't know if I should pause for you to. No, I mean it was a, it was a complete sort of curveball question like you know it it, persistent resilient like Mm. an ability to network probably charismatic and articulate like all of these things Mm. uh you clearly have Mm. and needed to have in order to be successful in not in the the not only the philanthropy space but also an investment banking space like just like knowing how to interact with different groups of people of all kinds. Right. And is there, was that something that sort of you learned trial by fire or was something that was sort of just part of who you are was you were able to like in grammar school or high school, you were just able to talk to people kind of thing. Like how do you, how do you hone those sort of up in the cloud skills kind of thing? Um, I want to add something too. Yeah. Um, if I might, cause this is a little different, but yeah. Also, let's talk about it from a lens of privilege. That, yeah. that is a very good question. Yeah. And I think that that's a question you can ask someone, but there needs to be a lens of privilege because I think with women of color, you have to have those things. Um, but I'm going to digress. No, no, not, <laughs> even, not only do you have to have those things, like you- Those characteristics, you, I should say. You, you, if you're not, if you're coming from a place of privilege, you get to practice those skills earlier on you get to see more of the world so to speak and see more people whereas 
if you're coming from a place of not privilege, you're usually in one area and staying and seeing that world kind of thing. Does that make sense? I would say it's the opposite. I would say it's if you're coming from a place um, where you don't have that privilege, you have to be aware far younger of who you are and your place in this world um, because you have to be. Uh, yeah. When you're like, you're a mom, right? And you're, it you, sounds like you have young boys. And yeah. we talk about, we look at the things that are happening in terms of like, you know, police brutality and all these things that we don't necessarily want to get into, but I'm sure you've already had the conversation with your sons, or I'm sure you've already said that. And that's what I'm talking about, awareness of yeah. who you are. That is not a privilege. That is yeah. something you must do in order mm. to survive in this world. And so that's what I'm saying. I mean, yeah there's privilege in the space that you have exposure and resources for certain, certain people. Mm-hmm. But that, that idea that there is no privilege and you must know who you are. You must be aware uh, mm-hmm. in order to maneuver in this world that wasn't necessarily, if you're a person of color, marginalized group made for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I would say that at my dinner table growing up, I learned awareness. This mm-hmm. is who you are, Nicole. This is the color of your skin. You are a woman. Mm. These are the rooms that people think you belong in. These are the rooms that people don't think you belong in. Go get them. Mm-hmm. When I was awarded, crazy enough, a full ride scholarship to a boarding school in New Milford, Connecticut, mm. um, left New York City at the age of 13 and went to live in a dormitory like a college student for high school, I was the only Black female in my high school class all four years. Wow. Um, I feel like in addition to the awareness that came from my family, I was placed in environments of privilege because of those organizations that allowed me access and opportunity that made me um, sit in some uncomfortable spaces quite a few times that led me to this comfortable place, that led me to an understanding of the power that my race and my gender and my, my work style, my story, the power mm-hmm. that all of that holds, right? Mm-hmm. And so I sat in the space for four years as you know the only black female, the only one with my experience, um, surrounded by a lot of different individuals who I had to, I, had to, I don't wanna say succumb to, who, but who I had to um, understand and who I had to right. learn how to interact with and how to deal with, right? Emotional but intelligence. Oftentimes how I felt as well. Mm-hmm. I then chose to go to an all black women's college for a reason. And there was a balance that I was afforded there. And mm-hmm. I like to tell people that that high school experience and that college experience led to me being able to operate frankly in a world that is sometimes cruel and unfair in a world that sometimes is asking for me to use both of those things on a regular basis. Right. But I bet you hit it on the head. I do feel like I can operate in almost any room with almost any group of individuals. But I think that my experiences and places that I was put oftentimes and uncomfortable situations that I was put in oftentimes has helped me to get there, right? right. And I'm not saying that those uncomfortable spaces and situations don't still currently exist but I know how to navigate them better because I'm coupling this sort of awareness that I gained from my parents on who I am. And I'm grounded in that, right? It's the same thing you mentioned, Chinny, about the awareness I've given to my two, my two boys, right? Right. I'm a freshman now who happens to be uh, uh, at a historically black male university that I'm Mm. so proud of, but I feel like I've given him that awareness and now he has to navigate the right. how do I interact with various people in various spaces, right? And yes. he'll get some of that his <clears throat> three years in college and then he'll graduate, he'll get some of that in his first job experience and he'll right. get some of it in other places. But I think it's grounded in the awareness from your childhood, which is right. so important. Um, and then you figure out how to use it in different spaces as you're navigating through life. Mm, Absolutely. Mm-hmm, wow. Mm-hmm. Sounds, I'm going to say two things that I, I, I pulled from that. Having, we're going to add to our list. We've got resilience, awareness, uh, excellence, all these different things. Uh, emotional uh, IQ. Yeah. yeah. So um, emotional intelligence, EQ, I'm sorry. Uh, and, and then um, the, the second one, it's, it's I've, I'm, I'm drawing a blank, but it, it oh, relationships. 
right? The importance of relationships. These things are components to your success. Uh, emotional intelligence and building relationships with people. You said, you mentioned in the earlier of the show, in, earlier, in the show earlier, that yeah. knew your value and put you in places uh, yeah. to ensure that you succeeded and put the people, the right people around you to ensure that you were on that journey to authentic leadership. And it also sounds like you're saying that at a younger age, um, because of this awareness that your parents was helping you lean into, uh, it allowed you to find what your purpose was and understand your value as you went through these different experiences in your life. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I think to ground children in knowing that they matter is going to have such an impact on them in, in the long run, right? To know that we don't have all the answers because we don't have all the information, right? You're going to be the first generation college graduate. You're going to be the first, the first, the first, but this is who you are. There's no doubt about that part. There's no doubt about that part. How you use it in various spaces, who you use it with, how it evolves over time, um, you shape that. But ultimately, I think that grounding and that awareness is so important. And you hit something on the head, Chinny, that's so important to me is relationships. Right. You know, I created relationships with the people that I think led to so many different um, career changes and career opportunities for me. I put my head down and did the work and other people said, she's the one, right? People spoke my name when I wasn't in the room, those sponsors. And so mm -hmm. I do feel like that relationship building and that networking is has been so important, that ability to interact with different people, to your point, Emmett, led to these relationships that led to these partnerships that essentially gave me um, a lot of opportunity. Mm. Wow. So then in terms of like talking directly to our younger listeners, like yeah. how, what are th three things that they can do personally that can help mm -hmm. put them up into better positions of not or just better positions of identifying who are the relationships that I want to nurture and grow and who are relationships that I actually don't necessarily need to divulge a lot of energy and effort to kind of thing. Right, that yeah. can be a really yeah. hard challenge, especially amongst young people. I'm still Absolutely. going through that. Like my Absolutely. family's like, you need to do a better job of finding people who uh, add to your jelly bean jar rather than take your <laughs> jelly beans out kind of thing. Yeah. You know, Cause it's right. hard. It's a hard right. thing to sort of navigate. And yeah, it's, I'm curious. It's kind of yeah. building your I think executive one of the board. Things, yeah. One of the things that I think I did far later in life was focus on relationships rooted and connected to my passion. Right. Mm. So talking to people who share your values, surrounding yourself with people who share your values and who ultimately um, can be influential, whether that's a, in a personal or a professional way in what it is that you need to do. Right. Those people who are lifting you up, who are really feeding you and, and sort of really feeding and nurturing what it is that you want to do. I think too often, but oh, too often. And maybe this generation is, is the generation that changes this. Right. We were somewhat told what we were supposed to do, or we thought we knew what we were supposed to do, or we said these things aloud, but our inner beings were like, no, 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 what we really want to do is, and these things were either considered like side jobs or like, oh, right. that's your passion. That's not your right. whatever, right? Mm. I think relationships really need to be rooted in your passion. What is it Absolutely. ultimately you want to do yeah. and who's motivating you and pushing you to do that, right? Right. Um, and enjoying the now with that, like everything's in the not moment. Um, tomorrow. Everything is not going to come, you know, when you think it will, but like right. enjoy the now and it will right. come like it will. We've mm -hmm. learned these last two and a half, three years, right? Like there's nothing more that we can do than enjoy the now. It's like so, so important. And mm -hmm. then I would also like giving yourself permission to change. So I can enjoy the now. I can build relationships rooted in my passion, but if I decide tomorrow, that something else is for me, that's okay. That is that's okay. Absolutely okay, right? Absolutely. Like have a plan and figure that part out, but give your, yourself permission to change. I think that's been one of my biggest life lessons. Um, I'm coming from a very rigid, structured childhood where I thought I wanted to do A, B, C, D, E. Right. And here I am sitting today telling people a story about doing X, Y, Z. And they're like, well, how does that even connect? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. It's okay, they don't connect. They don't have to connect. Right. Some way, how they do overlap. Mm. Um, but it's okay. And I give my, I give myself permission now to accept that. That yeah. is my like my theory of change. That is how I evolve. That is my leadership. That is 
who I am. And I hope that can be like a living example, frankly, to a lot of other people that, you know, change is okay. Little risk is okay. Um, mm. It's okay to have that structured, rigid, rigid part and then transform into something else. And then the two can collide if you want that to happen as well. Right, right. That's that vulnerability space. You're not, no one's perfect. Like allow people to change and adjust. Yep. And those people who are for you will be like, okay, let's do this. Um, yep. Absolutely. As long as you're serving yeah. something greater than yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, can I add one more thing to that? If you don't mind, Emmett, uh, go. Nicole? Go, 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 go. Uh, you said relationships. I think the biggest relationship is the relationship that you have with yourself. Um, and under- yes, uh, making sure. Mind. Yes, yes. Yeah. If that would be, that's the answer to my, if I could tell my younger self, yeah. um, no one was saying when I was in my twenties, take care of yourself. Right. That happens now. Like right. we have this whole change on how we see people's mental, maybe the physical, but uh, you know, how we, t- how we tell people to take care of themselves now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm loving it and totally embracing it because mm-hmm. People didn't say that to me in my younger years. They just didn't. And so I really do feel like my younger self lesson is I would have told myself while doing all these amazing things, don't stop doing that. Take care of yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And also, and also just I've noticed amongst, you know, mid twenties, people in LA all go, go, go all the time. There's this fear that if you admit to your peers that, you're tired or you're exhausted or you feel like giving up that the boat is going to keep going and everyone's going to sort of just leave you here. And it's actually really liberating and really cathartic to go, no, I'm really tired. I'm exhausted. And maybe you have a good cry. (laughs) Maybe you just (laughs) like watch a movie (laughs) or something. You eat some ice cream in bed. Like you have that moment to be like, I'm exhausted. I need to like, just take a break Mm. and then say to yourself, okay, I took my break. I admitted to myself that I'm tired, that I wanted to give up. Now it's Monday. Let's get back to work kind of thing. Like, I think young people think if you take that time, like you'll be so far behind everybody else. Or you'll lose that opportunity or you miss this thing, but that's not true. All the opportunities and things you're supposed to have will be yours. You will be in the right place at the right place all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're, if you're leading with like, Passion is not exhaustion. Like right. we have to disconnect oh the two. <laughs> and so that's hard. That's right. still hard for me, right? Like passion mm-hmm. is not exhaustion. It's right. not, oh my God, I on my last breath, that means I've done such a great job. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes, no, you haven't. Yeah. Sometimes you haven't. And I think a lot of us were taught to equate the two. Um right. And it's just not, that's not how it works. Right. That's not how True. It works. So, that that yeah. no days off mentality is not right, y'all. So no. uh, take throw, that, throw that out. Take, take, yeah. take days, yeah. take weeks. Take yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We all need a sabbatical. <laughs> right. <laughs> Absolutely. Seriously. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, that's it, really. This has been phenomenal. This has been like a good... Nicole. session i feel like i've been yeah. you guys are great <laughs> this is what like when me and Kenny first came up with this podcast idea this was the this was the what we envisioned Vision, it to yeah. be like actually it was more I meant, conversation i missed so. the genius behind this so no. don't even listen to that no. but yes these no. conversations um but thank you so much for for being with us most importantly thank you for being vulnerable enough to share us with us how you arrived at authentic leadership that's everything that we talked about today um, and I appreciate your presence and I appreciate your energy yeah. and we wish you all the best. So thank you for being here with us. We'll thank be sure you. to let, I'll be sure to let all of LA know that you're only a Lakers fan. So that, <laughs> that will, that news will travel. <laughs> <with that. laughs> uh, yeah. Do you I'll have any, you Nicole, do you have any plugs, any sort of where can people follow you or what you're yeah. doing? Yeah. Keep tabs yeah. On all the things um, you're doing. Um, people can follow me on Instagram at CEO Nicole. They can follow the Dodgers Foundation on Instagram at Dodgers Foundation, also on Facebook um, and and on other social media platforms as well. Um, Check us out on LinkedIn, of course. Um, You know, time to time we have opportunities for folks to join our team like now. Um, And in addition to that, I just think that I have an amazing, some amazing work tackling some of LA's most pressing problems and to just follow us, frankly, and see what we're doing and let us know if you want to get involved. Mm. Absolutely. I would Thank love to so get much. involved. Yes. Jenny, did you write that down? It's C E O. I did. I put that. Did you say C L? Okay. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
And that's it for today's episode. Thank you all for listening and joining us on this amazing journey. I know, right? (laughs) If you like what you heard, we encourage you to like and subscribe. We've got so many more brilliant conversations and stories to share in the coming weeks. Um, Share with a friend, leave a review, of course, five star only. Um, Only five stars. Only five stars. Um, And just say how much you love both Emmett and I. And yeah, Yeah. that's it. I mean, no, uh, (laughs) I'm just kidding. Pretty much. Emmett, I'm I'm excited to hear what you are going to add to this because I know it's going to be a lot of flavor and intelligence and wisdom. No, and- no, 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 no. I wanted to ask you. I, I think uh, I always want. I always you you talked about at the beginning nuggets, little nuggets of yeah. things that yeah. she, she we were excited to hear and yeah. She provided a 40 piece McNugget meal. To be honest, <laughs> like there were so many good nuggets. Like I I personally my favorite, and I want to hear yours as well. Like my favorite was um talking about passion and exhaustion yeah and sort of I think yeah. so many people me included feel like oh I've worked to the bone I'm exhausted right. I haven't slept right. in three days like that's right. how I know I'm doing a good job or right. Like, right and passionate about it and right. she was like no actually no, that not, not might actually, no. actually mean the opposite it opposite means that you probably actually, don't really... like what you're doing right <laughs> Um, and just like becoming right. aware of that, I think yeah. for kids and for me and for anybody, not just kids is really right. important to be right. like, what, no, what is something that you're doing that you actually feel more energized right. after you've done it? And then maybe do that more right. than right. the thing you think you want to do, you yeah. know? Yeah. Yeah. What that about you? What was there? Was there a nugget that you, um, all liked? of it, like you said, but I want to say what you just said also in our, in our show with Brian Levinson, he talked about the difference between passion and exhaustion. And if, it, if yeah. it's leaning on exhaustion, then you're not probably doing something, you're not doing something right. And I agree yeah. with that. Um, but I think one of the nuggets that she dropped, um, and the one thing that is the foundation for all, the whole entire conversation is just, uh, she's positioned herself uh, to use everything that um, she has to serve something greater than herself. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that the work she does and all the accolades and all the rewards that come after it is because she's serving something bigger than herself. Mm-hmm. And she's willing to do that work. And that's what brings her joy. And so uh, that nugget is making sure that the passion aligns with serving something greater than yourself. And you'll always be in a mix of passion and pleasure and make, and you'll always mm. be in a place where you'll have people around you. She, she mentioned this people around you who support your work, uh, hold you accountable, but also tell you, look, Emmett, chill out, take some yeah, time for yourself, seriously. recharge yourself. You need it. Seriously. Don't, don't shame yourself because you, you're not going 24 seven. And Listeners, that for me was it. You, I couldn't agree. Listen to what Chinny is saying, <laughs> people. God, no. If you're interested in learning more about what you can do, to be doing something greater than yourself, follow what she's doing, follow her on Instagram, follow the Los Angeles Dodgers Foundation, or, (laughs) you know, Peace Players is doing something kind of (laughs) similar. You can learn more about what we're doing at Peace Players by visiting our website and following us on social media, mostly at Peace Players International and the Play It Forward podcast on Instagram, Facebook, Mm -hmm. Twitter, LinkedIn, you know, Etsy? No, I don't even think you can follow people on Etsy. Maybe you can, but definitely we don't. Peace Players doesn't have an Etsy store yet. We might. We, you never know. We might start selling our, our clothes. Times are tight these days, so oh who goodness. knows? Etsy. Okay. But take care. Jenny, take care. You know the drill. I'm yes. going to lie down. Bye. Bye. Lie down.